Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Jose. I am uh, with the Electronic Frontier Foundation and uh, spoke on some of these topics last year, and now I've been tapped to moderate. Um, and so I'm uh, just by way of a little explanation, I am myself, I am uh, in the activism team. I work with local groups through the, through the Electronic Frontier uh, Alliance, which EF Georgia is a member of. And if you are in a local tech group, feel free to reach out to us. We would love to have you. Um, and I also have a long history of doing organizing around police uh, brutality issues and police abolition, including through Cop Watch uh, for the last 25 years, um, off and on. And so I'm going to let the uh, rest of the panel introduce themselves and then start asking some prompting questions and then obviously make sure that we have time for some Q&A. Um, before, uh, before we get started real quick, uh, can we get a show of hands from those who can raise their hands? Uh, how many people are from Georgia? Oh, that's great. Do we have anybody from any other parts of the country that want to shout them out? Alabama? So rep, rep the deep south. That's great. Uh, so I'll let the rest of the panel introduce themselves first with my colleague, Matthew. Uh, hi, everybody. I'm Matt Griglia. I'm an author and activist and a senior policy analyst at the Electronic Frontier Foundation, where my specialty is police and government surveillance, uh, and often increasingly where it overlaps with private and commercial surveillance as well. I'm Leah Holland, uh, there she. I am campaigns and communications director with the National Queer Women-led uh, Human Rights Organization Fight for the Future, uh, where we work a lot with mutual aid organizations such as uh, reproductive uh, justice organizations and uh, recently starting to do a little bit more uh, with folks like the Atlanta Solidarity Fund. I'm Marlon Kautz. I am a grassroots uh, political organizer here in Atlanta and co-founder of the Atlanta Solidarity Fund, um, an anti-repression organization that helps bail activists out of jail and get them legal support uh, when they're brutalized by the police or faced with um, malicious prosecution. I am also one of the defendants in the sweeping RICO prosecution that's being brought against activists and organizers um, associated with the movement opposing Cop City. Uh, so if we can start with an introduction to the issue of Cop City, um, which is on, which is leased currently uh, by the Atlanta Police Foundation, that is the the, the land that it's on. Um, so we'll get into the the Police Foundation and uh, the kind of the privatization of uh, law enforcement in a bit. But first, let's start with an introduction to Cop City and maybe the movement that has been pushing back on it. Um, if Marlon, you want to get started? Sure. So Cop City is a proposed. Uh, training campus and facility for the police um, that is one of the largest proposed in the country. Um, it has been proposed as a kind of militarized police training facility um, that is proposed to span hundreds of acres um, in South Atlanta. Um, since it was announced, um, what, probably four years ago by now, three years ago by now, um, it has been met by fierce and continuous community opposition from all kinds of different angles, from environmental opposition, um, racial justice, um, police accountability, um, as well as just sort of like local governance concerns. Um, many different segments of society have come out opposing this facility. Um, and so if you know, if you are from Atlanta, which it seems like many of you probably are, you've been hearing about this issue for years. Um, and the most sort of um, conspicuous characteristic of um, the Cop City project has been the movement opposing it, uh, which has been probably one of the, the biggest, most powerful, and um, most effective um, political movements in the city in quite a long time. Um, and the effectiveness of that movement in challenging the political agenda behind Cop City, uh, the Atlanta Police Foundation, um, City Hall, the mayor, et cetera, has prompted one of the biggest campaigns of repression by the authorities against political activists trying to basically engage in you know, the civic process. That's how you know it's really effective. The harder they try to smack it down, the better job you're doing. So what are the, some of the things that the movement kind of has organized around? How have they been responding um, over time? And then where are we at right now? I mean, the so one of the most notable things about the movement opposing Cop City has been how uh, how, how broad and multifaceted it is. Um, 
it encompasses um, student organizers on campuses in Atlanta, um, artist groups, um, uh, black community organizers um, in uh, in neighborhoods in Atlanta. Um, it encompasses parents, um, uh, environmental watchdog organizations like the Sierra Club, um, many uh, like anarchists and um, uh, ecological activists from around the country um, have come to Atlanta to participate in actions opposing uh, the construction of the facility. Um, and many locals have participated in. So like there have been marches, there have been um, direct action protests where people have locked themselves to things. There have been mass turnouts to City Hall where hundreds to thousands of people have come to speak out about the issue and insist the City Council listen to it. There have been lawsuits. Um, there has been um, sabotage against construction equipment that's trying to be used to cut down the forest. Um, kind of all across the board, we've seen all of these different types of, of measures and efforts to, to, to prevent this project, which clearly does not have the, the public mandate. Um, yeah, I don't know. I, I, Lots I, of different things. <laughs> I noticed in that list, you let out, left off a very controversial tactic, um, that's been mentioned in the indictment, which is letter writing campaigns. <laughs> or based on what we know the atlanta police department has been surveilling uh pizza parties as well you want to talk about that a little bit yeah so the the, the brennan center for justice out of nyu law um filed a giant public records request with the atlanta police department over internal emails regarding the suppression and surveillance of people trying to stop the construction of cop city and one of the things they found was um rampant and systematic uh, social media surveillance of activists who are uh, associated with the movement, um, which is uh, unconstitutional. You cannot surveil people just because of their political beliefs. Um, there was a, a very, very famous case out of New York City in the 1970s, uh, which involved the, the what they call the handshoe agreement. Um, and this was a, a judge found uh, reiterated again that police cannot surveil people purely because of their political beliefs um, and and the associated political movements they they belong to and so in New York the Hancho Agreement has been this thing guiding the New York City Police Department that they cannot watch people just because of their politics and there have been a number of times where uh, it's been discovered that they've been violating that it's gone back to a judge often the same judge who gave the original ruling in the 1970s who has again reiterated and sometimes even strengthened the belief that the idea that you cannot watch people based purely on their politics. And what we saw out of the Brennan Center release of these emails is that the Atlanta Police Department has been systematically watching social media associated with the movement to stop Cop City, up to and including things that have nothing to do with direct action, things with, you know, uh, um, door knocking and canvassing for um, trying to get a petition for, for the ballot initiative, as well as just like other kind of like reading groups and discussion groups about police abolition and about Cop City. Um, can you talk about some of the other kinds of repression, some of the criminal prosecution, some of the financial um, attacks on some of the, the movement that we've seen in the last couple of years? Yeah, so um, as an organizer with the Atlanta Solidarity Fund, which does anti-repression work and has done this work in Atlanta for, I don't know, eight years now, um, I have kind of this historical perspective on what repression of movements looks like in the city. Um, and in the past three years with the advent of the movement against cop city what we've seen is a total departure from the norm a, like a, an extreme escalation in the level of repression from the authorities against the local activists um it really started in 2020 um with the with the uprising against racist police violence that happened here as well as all over the country um that was kind of the point that it seemed that uh city hall as well as the police department and its auxiliary, the Atlanta Police Foundation, which we'll get into, um, made a decision that they were going to invest heavily in ensuring that popular protest, like the 2020 uprising, never happened again. Um, and that the police were equipped to do whatever they needed to make sure that political protests 
never got out of hand, uh, never got to the point that it could threaten business as usual or entrenched political interests in the city. Um, and that is when we saw the proposal of the Cop City project born, um, you know, was in 2020. The repression itself, um, it started out, uh, you know, in 2021, let's say, it started out as sort of like run of the mill political repression, what you would tend to see um, in, you know, during any sort of like political protest. Um, cops show up, they look a little intimidating, they maybe, um, you know, push people off of the street and onto the sidewalk when they're marching, something like this. They make a couple of scattered arrests. And usually that type of repression, just kind of like bullying people, roughing them up a little, usually that's enough to discourage a movement, to get people to go home, to get them to decide, you know what, this isn't really like worth all the hassle. Um, you know, I'm going to stay home now. But in the case of the movement against Cop City, it did not. In fact, it did the opposite. The, that level of repression um, made people indignant and more and more people started coming out to participate in marches, to come to City Hall, um, to, to really push this issue. And in response, uh, the, the city government did not take a step back and think, oh, maybe there's something wrong with our public policy here. Maybe we should reevaluate this plan. They said, there is something wrong with this protest movement. What can we do to repress it? Um, and so we saw the Atlanta police begin to make uh, mass arrests, you know, targeting everybody at a protest, arresting you know, like two dozen people at a time indiscriminately based on, uh, you know, the appearance that they were protesting the police, right? Um, there was one protest um, that I was actually arrested at. Um, I was arrested in a public park. I was charged with being a pedestrian in the roadway. And I was arrested along with, I think, 16 or 17 other people, some of whom were bystanders who had just come to the park to look at what was going on, but because of their age and maybe apparent political leanings, they were assumed to be protesters and therefore they were cuffed and taken to jail. Um, so once again, you would think that like this level of repression would cause people to take a step back to kind of like take the wind out of a movement, but it did not. We saw more and more, you know, hundreds and even thousands of people participating in like broad public gatherings against Cop City. And that was the point uh, at the end of 2021 and into 2022 when we began to see the real kind of like um, bizarro level of repression, um, which was the authorities began to use domestic terrorism charges against protesters. Um, they arrested people who were doing things, who, who were alleged to do, have done things like sit in a tree and refuse to come down when the police said, we want to cut this tree down. Um, and they charged those people with being domestic terrorists, which cover, which carries a, uh, a penalty of up to 25 years. Somebody correct me if this is wrong. 25 years in prison if, con if convicted. Um, and they said publicly we will be using the domestic terrorism charge against everybody that we arrest in connection with the cop city movement because that's what this movement is it's a terrorist movement it's not a political protest it's terrorism um and you know so there's there's a pattern here obviously like you might think that the threat of being arrested as a terrorist and thrown in jail for 20 years would be enough to discourage people from continuing to protest but insanely they didn't they kept going the movement was so strong and passionate that it insisted on you know continuing to push the envelope continuing to demand to be heard um and so kind of well so so two things happened after that that are important to mention and one is that the police murdered a protester in the forest um manuel tortiguita Tehran um was killed um by police in the forest and there still has not been justice for that. Um, and the second thing that police did is they brought this massive sweeping RICO indictment against 61 people, including myself, other organizers from the Atlanta Solidarity Fund, um, and just like a whole slew of other people who they had decided were somehow the architects or the participants in everything that had happened related to the movement against Cop City.
and that case is still ongoing. Um, so there's, you know, I, I can't get into a lot of details about what's going on with that. We're all trying to make sure that all of those people, you know, beat that case and don't go to prison um, and also hold accountable the, um, the authorities who are bringing it. But um, yeah, that kind of brings us up to today and where we stand with repression. Are there, uh, is there a little bit of background on RICO charges, what they're intended for, how they've been used that one of you might be able to do? Uh, I mean, neither one of us are lawyers, but uh, RICO I mean, charges we... certainly come against the mafia originally. Yes, I mean, yeah. RICO charges were, were built uh, to fight interstate cases of organized crime right. in which money was, was be passing over state lines to fund what was illegal activities and was developed to fight the mafia in the mid 20th century. Which is a for profit entity as opposed to a protest movement. <laughs> I would say we're not typically a for profit movement. Um, so, well, and, and an important thing to note about RICO as, um, you know, a, a prosecutorial framework is the key thing that it does is it criminalizes association. Right. Um, you know, to be prosecuted as part of a RICO case is not necessary that you have done anything. Um, the, the, the only case that the state has to make is that you are associated with people who did crimes. And by that association, you are now criminally implicated. Um, and the, the terrifying and novel and definitely unconstitutional thing that the authorities are trying to do is they're trying to say that political sympathies the fact that you believe the same political ideas as other people that makes you associated with them and therefore responsible for any of the things that any of them are alleged to have done which means then you can get the same criminal charges um right for things that they're directly accusing and may claim to have evidence against one person for but not against you and so this is a dream prosecutorial framework because it allows you to crush the very thing that allows social movements, political movements, any kind of campaign for social change to operate, which is groups of people who all think that the same thing is a problem getting together and trying to take action to change that thing. Um, it enables prosecutors and, and their allies to criminalize that itself, right? Like not the pol particular political tactics or campaigns or actions that anybody does, but political association itself is being criminalized. Uh, one other point that I want to take up, you you did mention that there were a lot of um, uh, terrorism charges that were also involved, that they're claiming that these are domestic terrorism um, cases. And when you are accused of something that has the, the T word in it, um, you are added to the terrorism watch list. Usually you don't know that you're on it. Some people are lucky enough to find out. Um, but you are added to it through the fusion centers. The, uh, the, the state or local law enforcement share things through a fusion center with the federal uh, law enforcement authorities. And then uh, you're added to a list that may mean that you are not necessarily added to a no fly list, but you get extra harassment when you fly. Uh, there are more surveillance capabilities law enforcement agencies can use against you um, in theory. Uh, and uh, they also send this to 1,400 employers, public and private, across the country. The ACLU found this out in uh, 2019. Um, and so it, it essentially is also a bit of a blacklist, but it's a blacklist with employers that none of these people know um, who those employers are. And just because you are found not guilty or, uh, or acquitted, it doesn't mean you're taken off the list. You're actually still on the list. So, uh, so that's another you know, kind of frightening aspect, the RICO charges, the terrorism charges. And I wonder if we can start talking about a little bit about the financial surveillance and financial repression as all well, as well that is uh, come upon these people. Yeah, want me to do that? Um, so as uh, as evidence of conspiracy in these RICO indictments, uh, one of the things that we saw is the sort of like systematic rundown of PayPal data of the reimbursements that you guys were, were, were doing to to protesters or or, or, or or what have you as as a as a as a as a solidarity fund um so as evidence of criminal conspiracy or what have you they said that PayPaling somebody to reimburse them for a garden hose or for glue or for any sort of very small thing like that uh, is uh, something that evidence of a crime, which is wild. Uh, and at Fight for the Future, 
before this happened, we'd been uh, talking a lot internally about financial surveillance as a concept and the fact that it was just as insidious or um, if perhaps not more insidious because there are so few alternatives as surveillance of communications uh, that the only like we could choose to use an encrypted messaging app like Signal or what have you at this time if we didn't want um, third parties to be uh, spy <laughs> spying on what we're saying or slurping up data on what we're saying to each other and packaging that, reselling it, using it, market, whatever it is. Uh, but when it comes to finance and how much of our lives is uh, digital and how many of our transactions are conduct conducted through a digital medium, um, you could either figure out how to use cash or you kind of have to submit to this surveillance regime, which is uh, everywhere and pretty a pretty big threat to activist movements um, and, and, and solidarity funds of all kinds, whether that be a disaster relief fund that funds get frozen because of some political disagreement or um, or, or, or because the person who was using the app did something that they that the, the app payment processor thought was suspicious to uh, a, a reproductive justice organization like an abortion fund or something like that sending money to um to people who are seeking care and fundamentally the way that these mutual aid organizations operate and they're fine with me saying this because every they, they all know it they know that their enemies know it um that there, it's just a, like that these PayPal pal accounts, what have you, are just giant honeypots of anybody who's ever been associated with an organization, of anybody who's ever received funds for an abortion or for gender affirming care. And um, that this is a big problem <laughs> and that these indictments um, that uh, in, in particular with the Stop Cop City movement uh, are an escalation of that and and perhaps an overstep, perhaps a moment where um, the need for privacy preserving alternatives is um, is becomes large enough that we might organize and take action to do that. And so we at Fight for the Future organize a letter from every sort of um, of fund from disaster relief to there were there were like COVID solidarity funds in Ohio or something like that, and a bunch of uh, reproductive justice funds, gender affirming care funds, uh, the the full spectrum, condemning these indictments and saying that these this this constant creation of like honeypots of association uh, through all of this financial surveillance that they're subjected to is uh, is really dangerous for. For their operations, for their um, for their employees, and uh, and for the movements that they that they support. Right. So, uh, does anybody want to introduce uh, the question of police foundations and the Atlanta Police Foundation? Sure. Yeah. So, uh, if the reason for the season, the title of the panel, um, <laughs> uh, police foundations are private. Uh, fundraising arms of police departments. So, for instance, uh, this is a very familiar form also when it comes to like public universities. Public universities will often have like a private foundation which does all the major donor fundraising for the university on top of the small stuff that people contribute every day and also the money they get from the state. So, police departments, they have their money that come from taxpayer dollars. They're public money. Um, there are a number of ways that police departments can get money. They can get it from private entities. We know giant corporations pay for specific surveillance equipment for the LAPD. Um, we uh, know that you know federal grants and federal surveillance equipment and military equipment come from the federal government. And the other way is police foundations. There are They are private fundraising arms which give money to police departments. Um, they are often have a kind of like a board of, of rich people who help do that fundraising. Um, and, uh, you know, in addition to the fact that police departments now like in some cities get 
over a third of municipal budgets, uh, the beast of policing has become so insatiable um, and so desirous of all the newest tech and toys and military equipment that the police foundations have become a way to really build up the police department's capacity for, for equipment, for organization, for technology. Um, so the police foundation is the entity that uh, owns the uh, or leases the the uh, the cop Land city that is being built um, and is leasing it to the APD. Um, it is a private entity, so it is not subject to the same controls that the Atlanta Police Department is. Um, if you want to replace the police commissioner, you cannot elect a mayor who promises to fire the police commissioner. That is not how the foundation works. Uh, and what is important right now is that it is not as also as transparent as a police department. You cannot, um, at least they are arguing, you cannot send a public records request to the Atlanta Police Foundation to find out what's going on in its emails the way you can for a police department. Uh, the problem with that is there is a lot of legal precedence that shows that when a private entity is acting explicitly on behalf of the state, suddenly their records are now also subject to public records law. So there is a case right now before a judge um, arguing that is going to decide whether or not the Atlanta Police Department Foundation is going to be subject to these same transparency measures that the police department itself is subject to. The, the only thing that I'll add to that is uh, the Atlanta Police Foundation is one of the most capitalized uh, f police foundations in the country. The second most. Uh, wow. New York. Yeah. After New York, uh, which was the original in the 1970s, the APF is the second most funded. Uh, and as a result, Atlanta's most surveilled city in the country, right? Absolutely. Definitely. Um, it's, it's, so it really acts as like, not just kind of like a fundraising mechanism for the police, but as an independent sort of autonomous police budget um, that cannot be cut um, it cannot be reallocated uh, and it cannot even be like uh, examined, right? Like uh, this is just like a budget for the police that operates independently. Um, and in Atlanta, that budget is so large that it has become effectively like a major real estate holder in the city. Um, the Atlanta Police Foundation invests in and holds a tremendous amount of real estate in the city, completely unrelated to its original purpose at all. Um, but just to give you a, a sense of the scale of money that we're talking about here, this goes beyond like what most people would think of as like city budget numbers. Yeah, the most recent uh, ProPublica uh, published um, tax returns for the Atlanta Police Foundation has them at uh, over uh, 31.6 million in assets. Um, just to bolster a few of those uh, remarks that people made, the board um, of uh, the Atlanta Police Foundation includes such wonderful uh, uh, local Atlanta citizens as Equifax, AT&T, Wells Fargo, JP Morgan Chase, Merrill Lynch, Delta, Georgia Powers, uh, UPS, Home Depot, Waffle House, and for good measure, a series of real estate firms and corporate law firms. Um, that is the board. They actually uh, formerly had the, the corporate identifications of each of these um, individuals on the board uh, until June of 2020 during the George Floyd uprising, where uh, mysteriously they and the uh, board associations of a number of other police foundations suddenly vanished from their websites. They forgot about the Internet Archive. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Internet Archive. Um... And if your brain grabbed on to oh, real estate investments and oh, real realtors there on the board, that's something that that we've seen a fair amount of at Fight for the Future. We're a very staunchly anti-surveillance technology org organization, um, and we've been involved in supporting a lot of local and regional movements to push back against technologies like uh, like block license plate readers or, um, Atlanta based, Atlanta based or, uh, or shot spotter, which is always on microphones in neighborhoods, listening for gunshots with up to an 85% error rate of gunshot detection. Uh, and it, 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 it's very apparent that these technology companies in order to sort of gain market share or legitimacy are often coming in and donating to the police foundation so that then the police foundation can purchase 
the surveillance technology that they're selling it and install it in the city or try it for free or what whatever like there's many there's so, like several different tactics to get these like quite faulty technologies that are really outrageous to any sort of <laughs> any sort of person who lives in the citizen of those of that town uh when when they look at how wasteful they are in terms of uh expense in terms of the actual like human power that it takes to respond to eight, 85% air rate of gunshot detection or, or 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 what have you but these are these are a non-transparent not publicly accountable way to get bad technology um spying on us throughout our neighborhoods and it's uh it's really hard to fight because it's so opaque and this is a super important trans uh, uh connection to make because i think in many ways uh, the Atlanta Police Foundation is a symptom of a much larger problem that includes all of these technologies, which is that more and more of policing is being privatized. Whether it is uh, a company that does face recognition that spits out the name of somebody police sh should arrest and they go do that without questioning how they arrived at that, or it is a giant well-funded foundation that is hosting more and more and more um, uh like everyday aspects of policing so that they don't have to use public money to do it so that they are less and less accountable for it um there's just more and more of policing that is moving into black boxes that we have access less and less access to as people who are interested in policing work as transparency activists um, and as people who are trying to oppose a lot of the more invasive uh, methods that police are doing uh, does anybody have any thoughts on or can explain to the to the crowd uh, Operation Shield um, and the Loudermilk Operation Shield Video Integration Center. Um, I can take that up if if, if need be, but I think it, I think you know it, it'll speak to some of this. And yeah, I mean, it, it, this is this is a a real time crime center, what they call. It. They are um, centers that are springing up in cities all across the United States, which is like a high tech facility where like every piece of surveillance tech uh, that the cities have access to are all being centralized they're all coming to one massive high-tech control center where they can watch all of it at once and oftentimes this includes like not just city surveillance but private surveillance as well so there is a atlanta-based company called fusis um which allows police to have access to private security cameras including like ring doorbell cameras as well so you you i mean fuse is a box you plug into a system all the cameras on that network get sent directly to the police. Often they are being um, kind of combined at these real-time crime centers. So there's uh, both all the city surveillance, also a bunch of private surveillance, a bunch of maybe semi-public or semi-private surveillance. So like in San Francisco, there's uh, big networks of called business improvement districts, which are semi-private organizations that put up cameras that are run also through a central location that police can sometimes have access to. So they are all coming together at these real-time crime centers, and Atlanta has a big one that is also, surprise, surprise, run by the Atlanta Police Foundation. Um, so it, the place where all the surveillance in Atlanta comes together is not technically run by the Atlanta Police Department. It is run by the Atlanta Police Foundation. Just to give a kind of um, like a snapshot of what this what the vision of this kind of video surveillance is. It's not just, oh, we have a lot of video cameras. And so, you know, we can keep an eye on what's going on on the subway platform or on a given corner to make sure that nobody does any crime there uh they they've they give tech demos and you know they, they they regularly use this practice of tracking the movement of an individual or a vehicle across the entire city in its complete movement right you find a person on one camera and you're like i want to see where that person goes for the next three hours and they have a, a sufficient camera density that they can follow that person you know, in their entire route through the city, understand where they've gone, where they've who they've talked to, where they've gone home, anything that they've done, and then keep that information forever, you know, to use in whatever sort of like machine learning algorithm you want. And also, if they've saved video footage previously, they can go back and reanalyze it. And it doesn't even and it doesn't necessarily need to take them like human hours or human attention to do that. One of the big 
accelerations of surveillance is AI technologies that are where you're able to tell your AI, well, track that car, track that car and everywhere it's been for the past two years or, or what have you, something that would take many, many hours for a human to do uh, is, is much more achievable with, uh, with, with, with AI technology. And what that means essentially is a constant is, is potentially a constant state of surveillance, uh, active surveillance um, at the fing fingertips of any anyone um, of anyone, which is really concerning uh, and very very big brother. And it's not even just face recognition now; it's gait recognition. They can recognize your pattern of movement and identify you from how you walk. Or uh, other video analytics, like I've seen some companies that you just like type in pink backpack. And it will sh track just the pink backpacks. Like it is getting incredibly specific, and it is not just based on face. As of a couple of years ago, the uh, there were about thirteen thousand private and public cameras across the city of Atlanta that were integrated into this system, in addition to the automated license plate readers, as you mentioned. And they have also integrated in predictive policing software, uh, just as you said. So there is AI. You know, obviously it's an AI snake oil, but regardless, there is an AI that now allows police to then go to people's homes uh, because predictive policing suggests they may have more possibility of committing crime. So uh, we can see that, you know, here's a private entity that is dominating this surveillance and this surveillance system that can get gifts, go into the integration center from private other private entities. And then uh, it never, what is never going to go before the Atlanta police, you know, the Atlanta city council, like uh, what is, what is the way that critics um, of, of uh, policing and surveillance can kind of respond to this? Or what are the obstacles that this cr is creating for movements and critics and researchers and scholars? Well, uh, Jose, I heard that since they were going to have an AI doing this kind of predictive policing, that it was going to make sure that there wouldn't be any racial bias in the policing. Is that true? <laughs> oh, yeah, no, I don't think that's, that has not been generally how it should, works because in most of these cases, where is the input coming? The input is still coming from the data that police have been collecting. Um, the data is still, the, the input is still coming from uh, human intelligence and, and law enforcement intelligence. And so if they have surveilled one community in particular, Black people in the United States or Black people in Atlanta in particular, or immigrants or uh, queer communities or activists, then that's the inputs that are going to be going in, not from the uh, not from Home Depot and uh, and the other members of the board. Um, so, you know, again, if you all want to talk a little bit about how privatizing policing is happening in Atlanta and then what is the obstacle, what are the obstacles it's creating for the movements? Well, I mean, with, with the government, we like there are known levers for transparency and accountability. And with uh, a private entity like a police foundation, that, that like in the, the shortest way to answer, there's there's not that same transparency or accountability. Like we don't have input as the public into what that thing does. It just can essentially do whatever it wants. And uh, that's bad. <laughs> I'll say um, I'm not a policy person. I don't follow local government very closely. Um, but in following the movement against Cop City, something that has struck me pretty dramatically is, OK, you've got a very broad, very popular you know, movement um, for a particular civic change, which is actually a pretty modest civic change, right? Please don't spend a crazy amount of money on a thing that the public doesn't particularly want. Um, it doesn't seem like it would be a very uh, controversial issue. It seems like the kind of thing that would be like, oh, well, half the city signed a petition saying that they don't like this, and there have been continual street protests uh, and city council speak out saying, we don't want this. Maybe we should just you know, scrap this, come up with a different idea. Um, you know, so it's kind of a head scratcher why this project has like steamrolled forward regardless of any opposition. Uh, and one of the things that I realized in talking to people who kind of uh, who, who follow the policy more closely is that everybody in Atlanta, the city council people, even the mayor, they are all terrified of the president of the Atlanta Police Foundation. He is like 
um, he's like a more important power broker than the mayor, right? Because the mayor is going to be gone in a few years, right? Like the mayor comes and goes, but the president of the Atlanta Police Foundation is this figure that wields immense political capital and financial capital in the city, for, you know, sort of indefinitely. Um, I don't know. That's just like weird to think about, right? Like we think about the people who are in charge of the city as like the ones who got elected from our districts, the one who you know won the mayoral election. But there's this like shadow figure sitting on, you know, dragon piles of money, um, who seems to like put the fear into all of them. It's just weird, right? I mean, I think policy wise, is it's it's important to think about the the hurdles that exist when police want to buy and use new technology. Because right now in Atlanta, if police wanted to spend the money to buy a new piece of tech and deploy it, there is nothing stopping them. You know, uh, even if they couldn't get the public money to do it, that's what the Atlanta Police Foundation is for. They have a, a, a fail safe if there's not enough public money to pay for what they want. There's no hurdles at all. In other cities, the, the bare minimum of what we, of, uh, of what can be done is something called CCOPS, which is a, a type of policy that has been passed in cities all across the United States since for community control over police surveillance. And what these laws do on a municipal level is when police want to buy or use a new technology, at the very least, they have to do these things. They have to take it before a democratically elected city council and they have to vote on whether or not the police can can use and buy this technology. They need to publish a use policy. They need to say how exactly they're gonna use this and when and why. And then they need to allow for a public comment period for people who are angry about this to come and voice their concern about it. And this is in many cities this where this has been passed, police still get everything they want, but there is more of those check checkpoints that they have to go through between them and buying and deploying the technology. And right now Atlanta has none of that. Um, and when we talk about how Atlanta is, you know, I would agree with the most surveilled uh, city in America because there are so many overlapping jurisdictions of private, semi-private and public surveillance. And because there's such a big pool of money to buy this tech, I would recommend everybody goes to a resource we have at EFF called the Atlas of Surveillance, which is countless hours and hundreds of volunteers have combed including through including you in the future maybe yeah have combed through public records have combed through public uh, public uh, records have news articles press releases uh to look at what contracts have been signed between what surveillance vendors and different cities so you can look up your city and see what technology your police department uses um and if you look at atlanta there is no technology that we track that Atlanta does not use. Sometimes like overlapping vendors provide the same services to Atlanta. They have multiple vendors to provide the same type of surveillance. So um, there is there's data that shows, I think that Atlanta is probably the most surveilled city in America. We're coming close to time if people want to start lining up if they have any questions. Um, but uh, but I, I want to you know continue this thread. Like what is what is the danger of increased privatization of policing? Um, and uh, you know kind of like what level levers of transparency do we have? Um, you know because there's been a bit of a battle on that front. But first I'll let. Oh, I was going to ask for levers of transparency. I was going to ask uh, ask you all maybe to expound a bit on how who who's moving for more accountability here and how. One of the uh, one of the groups uh, is Lucy Parsons Labs, a Chicago-based uh, nonprofit that is also a member of the Electronic Frontier Alliance, um, which has attempted to sue the uh, the Atlanta Police Foundation, saying that the activities that they do that are for public entities the police department collecting data um, on on uh, local atlantans and then funneling that straight to the atlanta police department or holding the lease on cop city uh, should be things that are then subject to public records requests i don't know if we have any updates um, on that or if you want to talk a little bit about that i i think currently they're in discovery right now for this case so this is a case that will determine whether or not the atlanta police foundation is subject to public records requests. So that is ongoing. It is actively happening. I think right now they're at the, at the point of discovery. So we will find out probably, hopefully in the next few months. So what's the, what are the threats um, to people besides the fact that we can't always, we don't have transparency um, and can't push back on surveillance technologies. What is the threat of privatization of police and why is it you know, kind of ramping up right now? Um. 
I think the threat is less accountability and it's ramping up because people want accountability. <laughs> there's a there's a bit of a, a of an Ouroboros there where where we are um becoming more aware as a populace of these surveillance uh, of these surveillance technologies of police misconduct and of um of our the erosion of our rights to privacy um and we don't like it very much <laughs> and, and, and and that these these foundations, while they've been around for a long time, and sort of the the the, the grease on the wheel of 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 power of direct confrontational power, and how it's deployed in cities for longer than we've really been becoming aware of surveillance tech. Uh, it, it's it, it, it's fundamentally a lever that 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 that, that police, police want to pull, pull to go around the public, that corporations want to pull to go around the public and government to get what they want from police and um, and, and to do it in a way that that, that dis essentially disempowers um, all the all the people that are that are whose tax dollars are supposedly paying for these services. Um, yeah. And I think I mean, what's at stake is, I mean, is bodily harm. I mean, it is it is the increase of risk for everybody um, and, and not just the increase of risk for everybody. Also, just like not knowing why uh, and and not even being able to figure out why sometimes even when you go to court. So, I mean, we've seen cases where, you know, uh, shot spotter has given a ping uh, that a gunshot has gone off. Police have shown up to a scene expecting a gunfight, which means they have guns drawn. Everybody at that scene is at risk. Um, they've they've you know made arrests. They've pulled people out of their cars. And and in court, when you try to figure out, well, how did this happen? Why? How did I end up being the person pulled out of my car at gunpoint? Um, they defer to a company that is private and is under no obligation to tell anybody. And even in cases where courts have said, like, this is part of a court case, you, th this is like legal discovery, you have to submit documents for this court case, Shotspotter has asked the court to find them in contempt, in friendly contempt, so that they are not obligated to give their private information uh, or how their algorithm works uh, to release it in public in the court. So there are ways that not only are they keeping their secrets of how they're generating these alerts um, private, but even in court, they're trying to find ways to prevent having to reveal how this tech works um, because it would, you know, even though it would exonerate people who are being put in real harm's way. Yeah, and that's like a claim of like trade secrets or proprietary algorithms, and that's like that's one of the most commonly used excuses for to to, to hide bad tech from public scrutiny, from everything, from these sorts of situations to like the ebook ebook vendors with libraries and and universities and spying and things like that. It's a blanket, it's a blanket excuse to 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 not be accountable for um, building a bad technology, and it's one of the most commonly used tactics and. And that's and trade secrets isn't something that a law enforcement entity can claim to shield themselves from bad right. decision making, and so it's 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 a like an unholy alliance, more or less, between the public and the private sphere. Uh, to to the note on bodily harm as one of the things, I I'll take my work cap off to say this part. Um, I uh, you know the one of the one of the indicators to me of who the police work for is that after uh, the Atlanta police shot and murdered Rayshard Brooks, um, an unarmed black man in, in Atlanta, uh, there, was, there seemed to be the possibility of repercussions for law enforcement officers who were there at the scene. And the Atlanta Police Foundation, again, a consortium of corporations, no faith leaders, no unions, no civil society, corporations, uh, and corporate lawyers and uh, real estate firms gave a gift of $500 to each member of the Atlanta Police uh, Department uh, as a little gift for for murdering uh, a local resident to say, don't worry, we have your back. Here's a cookie. So, uh, you know, I don't know if we want to talk a little bit more about, you know, where the movement is now. Um, I, I don't see anybody any at the at the question, Mike, so maybe we could talk a little bit more about where the movement is now and how we can push back um, on this. Well, to add some color to this to this why now question, I think this is an important one. Um, we've seen, uh, you know, historically we see 
police unions as kind of like the primary entity that exists to advance and support police interests, you know, at the expense of rest of the rest of society. Um, and historically in the US, police budgets and priorities have always been understood to be sacrosanct, to be like the highest priority of any city government. Um, they kind of get whatever they want in terms of in terms of budget. And 2020, like like you're illustrating, was a point where that political consensus began to fray. Um, and and kind of everybody realized it. Um, and I think that is why we're seeing now the explosion of police foundations specifically, because there's an understanding that the police as an institution in American society is at risk of becoming subject to democracy, is, be is at risk of being subject to the public will and the reevaluation of priorities um, and the development of police foundations and private institutions to advance police interests is is kind of like a, a desperate reaction um, to ensure that the the historical agenda and role of police can be preserved in, uh, you know despite the resurgence of demo you know democratic will over the police institution just to, to bolster that a little bit the the first uh police foundation was the new york police foundation found in the 70s um the next ones weren't uh, founded until the late 90s but in 2011 the department of justice um colluded with the new york police foundation and some corporations including target uh to go around the country and say this is a great model but the big increases and the number of police foundations across the country, especially in the um, police foundations that in the last 10 years have uh, gotten a lot of funding and gotten a lot of support from corporations, was during a round of, of this kind of pushing to, for corporations to come together and create these police foundations after the, the Ferguson uprising in Missouri. Uh, so it was it, over half of the ones that exist now were founded between 2014 and 2016. And then there was a series of other pushes that began, began in 2020, including in some of the trade publications for police uh, that said, if there is an attempt to defund your local police department, uh, create a police foundation. This is a way to make sure that you won't have accountability and that you'll get extra funding. Of course, police departments were not defunded, but now they have this extra they have this extra asset um if if we can uh hear from matt and then we'll get this uh one question again oh sure briefly yeah i mean uh in, in my other life which is increasingly becoming a combined life i am also a historian of policing um and and one of the things i think is really important to note is like there's historical context for this in the sense that after the 1871 railroad uprising which is one of the biggest strikes this country has ever seen um there became a trend across the country of building armories big fortresses that housed a lot of weapons and which could summon national guards or state militias incredibly quickly and ramp up their capacity to respond to that type of movement of, of mass arrest um and, and protest. Um, and I think we are seeing really kind of the 21st century equivalent to that, that the cop city movement coming so quickly after these series of uprisings and and protest movements um, is we're watching in real time the state try to increase its capacity to deal with protests like that. And it, there is a deep historical precedence for it. We have two questions. If we can get both of your questions and then uh, we'll put it to the panel. Yeah, a couple things. Is there, um, it sounds like some of these technologies kind of have dubious uh dubious value to the police and both the public is there not uh do the police not go after these companies for just wasting their resources <laughs> i mean i feel like there's an incentive on there and like if they keep getting false calls for the shock calls right or whatever uh that they would go after them that's number one yeah number two is um do we have any like model cities domestically in the u.s that have like a really great police accountability system <laughs> and that are safe um, so that we can like, uh, so that whenever this debate comes up, right. And presumably somebody on the other side of the aisle points to, there's like no safe cities with uh, good police activism or whatever. Um, I can point to that, um, and failing domestically internationally, because I know like, uh, places like Paris and whatnot are relatively safe have some diversity and they have good policing as well, but I don't know their models. So. Can but we no get the, uh, can we get the second questioner? Um, uh, oh, yeah. Hey, so um, going back to something y'all mentioned earlier about the uh, 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 the panopticon that the police foundations are building, where they incorporate a bunch of private uh, security cameras and private surveillance systems. 
on a mechanical level, what does that look like? Yeah. Like, do they approach these private businesses and say, hey, can we, can you send us your data like on a live stream? Is that literally, oh, okay. Well, yes, I mean, that's oh, literally right. how this technology works. Fusus is, is they approach them with a box and they say, can we plug this into your router and it will forward us all the footage from your private camera network. Yes. Yeah, and also with Amazon, um, there was like was was a big like police partnership with like I think it was over two thousand different police departments across the U.S. where they were uh, the police had a special like plug in to the neighbors app so that they could request footage and um, and 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 various ways to to gain access to doorbell cameras regardless of the cons often regardless of the consent of the person who installed the camera and, and in some cities they give a discount or free rings to people who put them up if the police department gets to pick where it's facing for the first two years oh my god <laughs> Uh, can, can we answer? Uh, we've yeah. got one minute left. Yep. If we want yeah. to talk yep. about the uh, model cities and, and what calls. we do about the. Yeah, I mean, the, I, the I, answer yeah. is that city, what happens is police departments cancel these contracts all the time and we just don't hear about it as much. Right. So there are like, I don't know how many cities have paid for ShotSpotter and then canceled it because they're like, Dang. there are so many false cars, it doesn't really work. But the problem why they cling to it is because of the security theater is because people say, we are afraid of gun violence, what do you do? And they can say, well, there's nothing we can really do about gun violence, but what we can do is we spend a lot of money, we put up these microphones everywhere and we're being proactive. Look at us, we're doing something, so don't hate us because we're doing something about it. And so uh, the value is not necessarily to how it actually works, it's to the, the security theater of it. But the answer is, yes, they're constantly canceling these contracts because they're expensive and they don't provide enough utility. Yeah, so there's that, the security theater PR component. There is also the growing trend of uh, being able to say, well, the computer did it. Mm -hmm. The computer made that choice. We don't have to be accountable because the computer chose for us and um, the AI chose for us. And uh, these technologies are a, an accountability shield. And thirdly, um, because they're disproportionately installed in tra traditionally undervalued and disrespected communities, um, this is an excuse to bother those specific communities to keep showing up. If you're going to have a high error rate and maybe you want a high error rate, is your, is your excuse to be going back over and over again and, and harassing specific people? And, and do you have a sense of, uh, you, I want to kick that question to you about a model city. Oh, a model city? Uh, no, we're still working on one. Yeah. <laughs> but, but I would there also... There are a few cities that have, like you said, have cut the yeah. contracts. Um, and there, there certainly are, uh, you know, 18 or 19 cities that have CCOPs. And or banned face recognition, that yeah. have banned predictive policing. Um, one thing I would do, though, is, is caution you to expand your understanding of what safety is. Because police showing up to a, a scene of a shot spotter alert, guns drawn thinking they are coming to a shooting uh, is also unsafe as well as crime. That like that that an overactive police department that is very trigger happy is also a threat to safety. And that has to be considered when we're thinking about safety and not just about. Safety. So I want to thank our theater, uh, our, our, our theater. <laughs> I want to thank our speakers and uh, and also uh, make sure to reach out to us if any of y'all are, are interested in getting involved. Um, the Electronic Frontier Foundation, Fight for the Future, and uh, of course, the Atlanta Salary Bail Fund. Um, you know, we're all working on these things, and we uh, hopefully can can connect you to other folks who are doing so as well. So feel free to reach out to us. Thank you so much. For the Remember to write.